This is Carte Blanche, the podcast. One story every day that matters. Delve into the issues that impact you. Whether you're in need of a better understanding of the world around you or simply seeking inspiration or unique perspectives, you'll find it all here. The national election is set to take place on the 29th of May, and many analysts are saying this could be a pivotal moment for South Africa and its people. But why does it feel so different compared to previous elections? How much power does the youth hold? And could we see a dramatic political shift, not just nationally, but regionally as well? Masa Kekana sits down with Kia Mohetswe Sepato from My Vote Counts to discuss these questions and more. I was really intrigued by a conversation that my colleague Govan Whittles had with Kia Mohetswe Sepato on Carte Blanche. And the conversation was so frank. I'm so excited to be joined for this chat by Kia Mohetswe herself from My Vote Counts. And a lot of talk has been made, but why I was so excited about this conversation is because it's young people talking. And I particularly was quite enthused by your passion, Kia Mohetswe. And a lot of people say, this is it, you know, this is the year. And you are one of those people saying, this is it. Welcome. Thank you. Yes, definitely. It is it. What would you say is the general voter sentiment in the run-up to this year's election? I think generally people are tired and they are wanting to see a significant amount of change. And there's an internalized understanding that change will take place if we take part in one of these events as part of our democracy, which is the elections. So I think that's why there's a drive for people to register to vote. I also think, irrespective of how people are feeling, there's an atmosphere of we've reached the 30-year mark where significantly young democracy, but we're sort of at the precipice of some form of a shift. I think many people are starting to see beyond the smoke and mirrors of how the ANC has conducted itself. And I think a political analyst said a while ago that when we're grappling with the weight that the ANC has in sort of popular imagination, we need to think about it beyond being a political party, but more of it being a cultural institution. And I think people are at the point where they are seeing that this is not a political party. It is a cultural institution. This is why my grandparents and my older relatives will continue to vote for it. How do I dispel this and how do I shift people's thinking and how how do I also take part in democracy to see the change that I need? You know what I also find interesting? When we hit the streets, Govan and myself just asking people about this upcoming elections and the number of parties they think they are contesting and around the question of if the person is voting for the party, whether they're voting for the person that's leading that party or perhaps the policy slash promises that they make. And what I find interesting now is that with the emergence of these smaller new parties, you speak of, you know, this ANC now being more of like a cultural institution, and people are are wary of that. And hence we are seeing more and more political parties coming up. Whether that is for our good or not, it is our constitutional right. But the formation of a party like Mkundu Esizu, for instance, there are people on the ground saying they're going to be voting for them, but they haven't actually said what their policies are. They haven't actually said who is actually running the show apart from having the former president, Jacob Zuma, as its face, and the person who registered the party at the IEC. So very little that they're going on in terms of like the meat of the political party. But just having the personality has proven to garner some support for them already, which I guess the question then stays the same. Are people voting for the actual policies? the political party at large, or the person running it? Actually, it's an important point that you're putting forward. And I think this is a point that 
many people within democracies are grappling with, right? I mean, it even happens in the US and it happens in other Mm. parts of the world. And if we're zooming in on South Africa quite significantly, the the political culture that exists and has been enjoyed, I guess we're seeing a relationship between freedom and democracy. So a lot of the policy work and a lot of what does a governing party bring to the table and what does it mean to govern and representative politics and where Mm. the people lie in relation to that equation have been kind of topsy-turvy. So how the ANC was able to not only usher in democracy in 1994, but a lot of the organizing that was happening on the ground was, you know, we're going to vote for Mandela's party. So there was never really yeah. a conversation yeah. on the ground about, mm. but what does Mandela's party bring in other than freedom? So now what we're needing to do, and I think each and every single person in society and organizations within civil society, we need to go back and investing quite significantly in civic education. Voter education is different from civic education. People need to understand how democracy works, what is democracy, what are elections and so on and so forth, so that we can start moving away from the personality and more of what is the party bringing to the table. So we will see a rise of political parties like MK who benefit from people presupposing that democracy and elections are intertwined with freedom and the people who are the faces of political parties are the ones that are going to continue to help us have freedom or they're going to continue to help us live under the current status quo. And another thing this is coupled with, and I think I said it to to your colleague even, is that there's a culture of not necessarily reading for meaning in South Africa. So that means that we don't engage robustly with the political party manifestos. We just hear these Mm. popular stances and we accept them. So I think what needs to happen globally, but in South Africa as an example, we need to shift the political culture and we need to kind of work towards having an informed citizen so people can make informed decisions, not based on who's wearing the most beautiful regalia and who's able to sing and dance on stage. Mm. And also speaking of that civic education as well, just to also educate on the different spheres of governance, because a lot of the times we will hear issues being conflated between local government and national government. And I think it also is one of the loopholes that politicians use to sway their way as well. But I want to talk about the youth. The youth have been widely spoken about when it comes to this election. We saw, again, unprecedented number of youth going to register to vote compared to previous election years. However, by the time the IEC closed the voter registration deadline, there was still some around 14 million unregistered youth who were eligible to vote but opted not to. Now, if we take a look at those numbers here, 14 million youth that could have gone to the polls. In the last elections, I got about 10 million votes. Do you think in this election, albeit those 14 million outstanding, the youth are the ones who hold the power? Yes. I'm hesitant because these are mantras, adages, and things that we hear constantly. But from a numbers perspective, yes. When I say from a numbers perspective, young people are the majority within South Africa and actually Southern Africa as a whole, or even the African continent. So politics, how the economy is supposed to work and how our lives need to shift and develop needs to be geared towards young people. So the conversations that we should be having and the things that we should be thinking about is why aren't young people registering to vote? What are the obstacle challenges or limitations to being able to register to vote? And then what are the challenges and obstacles to translate a registration to voting. And it Mm. goes back to the point around civic education. At some point, I went to school. (laughs) And when I was at school, we didn't learn about the different uh, arms and pillars of government. I only got to learn how government functions, 
when I went to university and I studied political sciences and I studied South African politics. And I mean, there's been suggestions by different young people, even political commentators, around introducing a form of civic education within life orientation. Let us not only be taught how to draft a CV, let us be taught how the National Assembly works and how, for instance, the National Assembly is the one technically that votes for a president. And many people don't know that. So I think let's ask the questions about why aren't young people taking part? How can we remedy that? And then we can take it forward. I think the challenges right now is that the vast majority of people in South Africa, which are young people, are not being engaged. Whether it's government or any other organization sees engaging young people as an extra thing somewhere there that needs to happen in the ether. Or there's this notion that the conversation is happening on social media, so they'll get an intern to post three TikToks and hope that they'll get traction. You know, that's not how it works. So let's be where young people are at. Let's figure out what are the challenges and let's invest time, energy and money in activating young people to take part. You actually just took me back there because I remember I know primary school, high school learned nothing that has to do with anything to engage governance. But I also, too, went and studied political science. And that's the only reason why I learned some of the stuff that we do know. But it shouldn't be that you should have to go and get a degree in politics for you to be able to engage with your democracy. But what do you think some of the key issues are this time around that voters will be basing their decisions on? Load shedding, crime, (laughs) housing, geopolitics? I think you named it right there exactly. What's happening geopolitically is not something necessarily that working class people or poor people are really focused on. So I think many of the decisions that people are going to be making is in relation to the fact that what is happening to me today and what's been happening to me time and memorial and who do I then vote for to represent me, to implement the change that I need? So I think one of the things that within the unemployment cluster is the conversation around social security or social grants. What are political parties saying in relation to the universal basic income grant? And this is beyond the SRD grant. So this would have to be beyond yeah. that and would have to be bigger than that. And I think that's one of the things that, that are going to sway people to make a decision. And I think with the load shedding point, it's coupled with, I guess, the just transition or how whoever's wanting to be in power is thinking about dealing with the climate crisis. We had the hottest February, we had the hottest January, and so on and so forth. There's floods, there's heat waves, and um, Mm. in provinces like Limpopo in the Northwest, people are passing away from heat stroke, and there's also issues around access to water. So I think those those are some of the big ticket items, and geopolitics is one of the things maybe that those people who are within the middle class and are taking part in global, not global politics, but are having to keep their interests protected by how our state maneuvers geopolitically, they will be interested in that. I mean, class is a very big thing to point out in this as well. And sometimes what is going to affect your bottom line may not be the thing that affects my bottom line. And that is the difference between how people decide who to vote for. But you would also think, Gia, with all these issues that we've just been speaking of, load shedding and unemployment, access to water. I mean, right now in Johannesburg, we're going through water shedding. Some areas have gone for days and days and days without water. Again, that's a local government issue. But with all these problems and challenges that the governing party is facing, you would think that the opposition would have an easy goal here you would think that this would be a no-brainer. However, it just doesn't seem to be that easy. It's far more complicated. I mean, what does the ANC stand to lose in these elections? Can the opposition actually play a very strong role in making sure that these own goals are captured? That's a deeply interesting question, actually, and complex to answer. I think the reason why the opposition parties are not able to claim and push own goals is because they're not inspiring change. 
So when, for instance, you look at the Democratic Alliance's manifesto, they're literally saying, we will do what the ANC has not done. We're at a point in the country where we're not just needing what the ANC has not done or has done to be remedied. We're needing a plan for the future. We can't be living for every five years. A clear-cut roadmap that's going to talk about the things that South Africans need and how we plug into the rest of the world. So I think the opposition is going to struggle to quite significantly shake the ANC because they're not inspiring hope or change. Another thing is that we might see coalition governments at a provincial and and national level. So I'm not saying that there's going to be a landslide ANC victory, but when the ANC loses its majority, it's not because the opposition parties have absorbed that. It's because actually people feel like there is no alternative to the ANC. And you can see that quite significantly with opposition parties not putting forth clear-cut, great ideas and solutions. They are just saying, we will do what hasn't been done, and it ends there. Coalitions, that's a big one. If we just look at the city of Tswane, Johannesburg, what's going on in Ekurhuleni, the thought of that happening on a provincial and even national level is daunting. And the reality is coalitions are seemingly knocking on our doorstep. How scary is this? And how stable do you think they could be on a provincial and national level? Well, it's hard to answer the question without my own personal biases because I live in Johannesburg and my family lives in Pretoria. So I I know the pain and the drama. Yes. (laughs) I I, I feel it viscerally every day. (laughs) And I... I I want to say that we've had a coalition before at a national level. During 1994, the ANC within the Tripartite Alliance did not get an absolute majority. So they then had Mm -hmm. to kind of link up with, you know, the National Party at at that stage and the IFP. And it was something called the Government of uh, National Unity, right? And... No one, from my understanding, of course, I, I, I was too young at that point to remember anything. But from my understanding, there wasn't thorough, clear-cut turmoil and a shutdown. We were all trying to figure out how can we push South Africa out from where it was and move it forward. So I think when we are cautious and nervous and scared about coalitions coming in. We shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Coalitions have happened before and coalitions work in some places as if everyone is trying to move towards a particular goal. I mean, Germany has enjoyed a democracy with coalitions for close to 75 years. So I think what we need to be thinking about as South Africans is to collectively demand to see the coalition agreements that political parties have drawn up. Because I think each and every single political party has a feeling that we will have some form of coalition. So we need to know who is going to go in bed with who and what happens underneath the comforter. Because if we don't know what's going to happen underneath the comforter, it will then give the opportunity for anything to happen. Two minutes, there's President A. Six minutes later, there's President B. But if South Africans know what are the nitty gritties of the coalition agreements that political parties are going to draw up, and we know them before the elections, we are then able as a people to collectively think about what are the ways in which we can then hold these coalition government accountable. I want to say something or underscore this by saying one of the reasons why at my vote count we consider this year was an important year is that it's a year where we've been asking ourselves questions in relation to our democracy. So we need now as a people to go back and figure out what are the things that we are wanting to put in place to transform our political system so it works for us. And if we don't think that's through as a people right now, we're still going to have the same challenges in 2029 or even at the local government election level where we haven't thought through how do we hold the people accountable. So I think we can problematize coalitions if we don't know how they are going to work. But once we push and press political parties to say, hey, 
why are you quiet? You've dropped your manifesto, cool. But what happens when there's a coalition? What are you going to do in relation to that coalition? Who are you willing to go into bed with and not? Then we can figure out whether this is going to make sense or not. Another thing that we must remember, chaos erupts, right? Because political parties are not actually fighting to represent and serve the people. At the moment, political parties are jousting for power. So once again, South Africans need to think about how do we understand that political parties are jousting for power? Political parties want a big share of the ANC's majority. How do we use those two things to our benefit? You know, I really wish you could bottle up that optimism around coalitions and sell it to some of us (laughs) because I'm unfortunately one of those people who's kind of almost throwing the baby out with the water. And it is because of those reasons that you do mention and highlight that today political parties are just adjusting for power. And when we look at the first national coalition government of that national unity government, it was a different time and era. And we have changed dramatically so much so right now and if we worked with a little bit of history since 2016 of local government elections what our political leaders and officials have shown us is that they don't yet have the maturity of running coalition governments just a few days ago in the city of Ekuruleni there was another brawl in council late at night and these are Honorable men and women who are supposed to be public servants who are fighting over positions and power. So it's a little bit disheartening, but I do appreciate that there are solutions. It isn't just doom and gloom. But Mm. what I wanted to add when you say we should demand from political parties to say, look, you've dropped your manifesto, cool, shut. But what happens if you don't get an outright majority? Who are you willing to work with? Who are you not willing to work with? And I'll tell you, Gia, they have a standard answer. They always like to say, I don't like to talk coalitions before the elections eh, eh, because I don't want to go in with a loser stance. I will rather talk coalitions afterwards. And I think that's deliberate. I think that's deliberate because they're already having those discussions and they already do know that none of them are going to get the outright majority. So they have to talk to each other. And behind closed doors, those conversations are already happening between parties that are swearing at each other on social media platforms and arguing with each other in public. But behind closed doors, they are talking. They should at least let us be privy to those discussions too. We, as an electorate, to your point, should be demanding that of them as well to say, it's not enough to say you've given us your manifesto and you don't want to talk about the talk of coalitions when the writing's on the wall and you're already having the talks anyway. Exactly. You know, these are existential problems of leadership and representative politics where the electorate or people or citizens leave democratic processes to the people that they think should be running the country. And that's then where we fall into this trap. But things have become so overly complicated because the person living in a country has left political decisions around their life to people who say they want to represent and serve, but haven't been doing that. So there's a lot of work to be done, but within the melting pot of work to be done, people need to take back their power and also assume responsibility. Absolutely. But what do you think the current anger towards the ANC, how do you think it will translate at the polls? Because there is clearly anger but they would also like to focus on the success stories, talking about Denzualo, whereas some will say Denzualo is actually a sad story. Some will say Denzualo's story is a great story. But this current frustration and anger towards the ANC, how do you see it translating at the poll? It can be translated in many different ways, actually. I think if we're wanting to see possibly what might happen is looking at the 2019 local government elections and how certain areas in Gauteng, which were strong ANC holds, people registered but didn't go vote. When you're just engaging with people, they'll say to you, because there is no political alternative to the ANC, but I don't want to vote for the ANC. 
So I think that that might be one thing that happens. And another thing maybe that might happen is people might end up voting for other political parties based on some of the things that they personally feel are important and critical. So, I mean, I can't fully predict, but these are some of the things that I'm seeing might happen. Speaking to the IEC, this year we have right now just over 350 political parties who have registered. And the final announcement as to how many will be contesting will be made later this month. But I mean, there are over 300. It's almost like we're spoiled for choice. And then we still have the argument of, but what do I vote if I don't vote for this one party? You have hundreds of other options that's <laughs> that, 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 that you know you, you know like when you go to a buffet right and i just feel like you just <sighs> for choice, you know yes just too many meats to choose from too many sides to choose from too many starters and then i personally when i'm in such a situation in terms of personal things not like voting in elections you end up making silly decisions because you just spoiled for choice Exactly. Or you end up making no decision, which is another concept called option paralysis. Yes. <laughs> I think it, it, it goes back to my point earlier, right? We can have 300 different options at the buffet, but if the buffet is just offering us cold meats and different variations of cold meats, mm. I'm going to stick with the pastrami that I'm usually interested in. <laughs> and, and, and that's what's happening, that we have a buffet, but it's just cold meats. We don't have a buffet with fruits, vegetables, yes. um, you know, and, and, and I think if we had that, then it would be something that's extremely rich and interesting. And like I said, many of the opposition parties have said they'll do things, but they don't know how to govern at a national level. And South Africans have only seen the ANC govern at a national level now for close to 30 years. So if I've been seeing one thing happen at a particular point, at a particular level constantly, if what's put on the table as a choice looks exactly the same as the thing that's hurting me, I'm going to go with the thing that hurts me. You know, people will say, the devil I know, then the devil Mm. I don't know. What needs to happen within South Africa's political landscape is we need opposition parties that are going to spark real inspiration. The fact that the DA governs the Western Cape doesn't mean they can govern eight other provinces fully. You know Earlier, you said something quite interesting as you were uh, talking about the work that you do at My Vote Counts as well. And you said this is an important election year. But some have called this 2024 election our 1994. How do you feel about this catchphrase? The line that's going around that 2024 is our 1994 falls into the same trap that we spoke about earlier around personality politics and big man politics. And it also falls into the line of having a political party become a cultural institution and not become a political party. When I'm walking around and saying to people, this is our 1994 What am I wanting people to think? I'm tapping into people's emotions and fears. I'm not actually putting forth real ideas and solutions on how I'm wanting to change things and bring transformation to South Africa. And before I let you go, Gia, my final question to you. Do you think that this year's elections is finally a chance for us to reset and reshape the country or... Is it too late? Bracket, I know it's never too late. I don't know, to be very honest with you. I think the fact that there's more people registering to vote, there's more people, for example, that you spoke to on the streets who are thinking and engaging on things, there's a lot of hope in relation to how we could possibly shift things. I think... One of the things that are going to show that there's been a shift is not only the results of the elections, but what happens afterwards and what people do afterwards that will show us that there's been a shift and that will show us that there's been change. But again, and I'm wanting to stress that what happens in May is a reflection of a moment within a democracy We as a people need to think what happens in the next 30 years, because clearly 
what we've had in the previous 30 years has produced different pockets of what Cyril Ramaphosa considers as Tinswalos, but we know Tinswalo doesn't really exist. So let's figure out how do we, in the next 30 years, have a country that works and operates for each and every single person living in it. Couldn't agree with you more. Yamo Khetsu Si Bado from My Vote Counts. Thank you so much for joining me on this conversation. Good luck to you and our country. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Have a good one. <laughs> sure, sure. Thanks. Bye. Cheers. Be sure to follow Carte Blanche, the podcast, to ensure you don't miss any of our election coverage in the weeks to come. And if you have a story to share with our team, why not head on over to the Carte Blanche website and let us know using the Tip Us Off page.